Hi, I'm Matt, uh, I'm a PhD student also in the Lagator group, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about a new technique we've been developing in order to quantitatively characterize mutation spectra in different selective environments. And here, the selective environments are uh, antibiotic uh, concentrations, so attempting to look at antibiotic resistance. So some background, of course, antibiotic resistance is a major public health crisis that is only continuing to get worse uh, in the coming decades. And a key sort of uh, weapon that we have in our arsenal to battle this is antibiotic susceptibility testing. So this means looking at the genome of an infectious agent, infectious bacterium, and then finding out which uh, mutations or changes it has in its genome which provide resistance to different antibiotics. Uh, and then you can tailor your treatment based off that information. But that relies on having a good understanding of what mutations in the genome contribute to different kinds of resistance, to different antibiotics, and in different strains. So we call that the uh, resistance spectra, uh, or resistance spectrum. And so typically, these are determined by sequencing of clinical isolates or sequencing the results of long-term experimental evolution experiments uh, using typically quite high antibiotic concentrations. Um, what we want to do is see if we can develop a quantitative approach to look at the first steps of resistance acquisition for a susceptible strain. Uh, and then we're going to utilize, well, we've utilized deep sequencing to try and quantify the effects of different factors on resistance spectra. So looking at the spectrum in different uh, antibiotics and in different background strains. So just quickly, the experimental technique. So it's first off, we do mutation accumulation in the absence of selection. Uh, and so we also split the sort of evolving population into uh, 32 different subpopulations in order to minimize the effect of, for example, if you get a high fitness muta or sorry, mutation that provides sort of just a, a broad benefit in the absence of antibiotic, that could sweep through the population. But if you have 32 subpopulations, that can only sweep through 1 32nd of the sort of total population. Uh, so we do that evolution in the absence of selection and then combine those 32 subpopulations into one large, uh, het very heterogeneous population. And then we expose that population to the selective concentration of an antibiotic. So here we've just used one times the minimum inhibitory concentration of the different antibiotics. So partially to really get as broad a mutation spectrum as possible and also to sort of investigate the... Uh, um, resistance spectra of a less characterized uh, uh, antibiotic concentration. Then we incubate these colonies for a few days, typically to get the uh, varying growth rates of different resistant colonies, and then harvest this heterogeneous population all together, uh, and then use deep sequencing to identify even rare variants in the heterogeneous population. So broadly, iterations of this technique should be able to quantify differences in mutation spectra to any force where there's a su uh, sufficient selective pressure that you can expose the heterogeneous population to. This is the experimental design. So we've used three antibiotics with different mechanisms of action, uh, and then four strains of E. coli with different single point mutations in RPOB that confer resistance to rifampicin. So first, this is interesting because it means we're looking at the acquisition of multi-drug resistance or secondary resistance uh, in the case of the three um, uh, res resistant strains um, and then the wild type, of course, for comparison. Uh, but it's also interesting because mutations to RPOB, RPOB is part of RNA polymerase. So these mutations, as well as providing resistance to rifampicin, they also alter the transcriptome of the strain quite significantly. And so you can often see variations in uh, fitness, in susceptibility to different antibiotics. And so we were hypothes hypothesizing you might also see differences in how you evolve resistance to other antibiotics. So with three antibiotics and four strains, that's 12 conditions altogether. And then we've done three replicates for each condition. And so that's a total of 36 samples that I've sent for sequencing. Uh, one of the samples uh, failed, and so 35 samples in total that I've been analyzing. So this is an overview of the results. These are 1,083 mutations across the E. coli genome that were detected in, all, in, in the, these 35 samples. And then the radial axis here shows closer to the middle uh, uh, the number of samples or just, yeah, the number of samples that each of these mutations has occurred in. So closer to the middle, you have the mutations that are occurring in almost every single sample. 
And then around the edge, you have mutations that have only occurred in, in one or two samples. So for the most part, I've only been considering mutations which do occur in two samples, because that's indicative of selective pressure for that mutation, right? That it's occurred independently in two different samples. In some cases, we are also looking at mutations that occur in one sample. So for example, genes uh, which, if it's, they're being knocked out, there's not selective pressure for one base over another. And so in some cases where there's a lot of mutations clustered all together, even if they're in different samples, we've considered those as well. But broadly from this, you can see that there's some hot spots, if you will, where there are lots of mutations uh, in the same region in, uh, and, and being sort of uh, present in multiple samples. These are regions where we might expect to see general resistance genes uh, as they're being mutated regardless of the antibiotic condition. So this shows uh, just an overview of the results in terms of the genic and intergenic uh, status of the mutation. Uh, this is 5,322 mutation occurrences. So that's each of these 1,000 NIST mutations weighted by the number of samples that it occurs in. And you can see that there's quite a lot more intergenic mutations than we would expect just based off the size of the E. coli genome, indicating that uh, regulatory changes are, can be favored over genic mutations during resistance acquisition. Then if we look at those intergenic regions, we see that while many occur uh, in annotated promoter or terminator regions, uh, quite a few are also uh, sort of uh, not annotated and potentially indicating uh, currently unknown or uncharacterized regulatory regions. Then looking at the genes that are being either mutated or affected by um, uh, mutations in the regulatory regions, we can see that many are associated with antibiotic resistance, as we would expect. A small chunk are actually associated with antibiotic persistence, which is typically thought of as transient and not uh, sort of genetically heritable. But here we're seeing there might be some overlap or, or sort of not clear definition of those boundaries. And then there's also a large chunk of genes which have not been identified before. Uh, we're thinking because uh, we're using not a typically used concentration. We're identifying many mutations. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at the sort of, as I said, the first steps of resistance. Oh. Uh, and then this is just looking at the type of resistance that we're, this isn't sort of annotated from uh, literature, but this is what we're trying to determine by looking at which mutations occur in which conditions. So across all conditions, probably a general resistance mutation, but if it's unique to an antibiotic, then that's, we're considering antibiotic specific resistance mutation. Uh, and there we have uh, sort of the separation of, of, of two different metrics, the 1,083 mutations here, or the 5,322 mutation occurrences here, and you can see just based off the way those metrics work. Of course, general is going to be much larger because that sort of sample size is 35 that that mutation is going to occur in to be categorized in that uh, column. Uh, whereas antibiotic specific, there's only 12 conditions that they can occur in. So I also did functional classification of the targeted genes. Uh, and you can see that, uh, by and large, there's sort of three main categories that it's coming in, which is membrane transport, translation, and energy production, cellular respiration. Um, and then these three categories are sort of prevalent in both genetic mutations and intergenic mutations. Uh, however, there are some key differences here. So most notably, you'll see toxin antitoxin mutation uh, or genes that affect sorry mutations that affect toxin antitoxin genes. Uh, it's very common to have regulatory ones, less common to have ones actually in the gene. Uh, and then there's also two categories present in um, regulatory mutations that are not do not have genetic mutations associated, which is lipid biosynthesis and transposases. So as I said, it's sort of looking at which genes, uh, which mutations occur in different samples. I've tried to categorize which are general versus which are antibiotic specific. And this shows you the number of genes and the number of mutation occurrences in those different uh, categories as I've defined them. So some, it's not clear uh, if, if the sort of the number of mutations isn't high enough, if it's not uh, sort of directly obvious that it is either clearly general or specific to one antibiotic. That's gone in that sort of miscellaneous uh, row in the bottom. But uh, we can also see here the sort of mutation space for specific resistance is quite different depending on the, on the antibiotic. So, uh, it seems sort of much easier, much more likely to have something that is specific to ciprofloxacin than it is for nitrofurantoin, where general resistance mechanisms seem more common. So this is a really cool plot that shows sort of the, the kind of analysis you can do when you have a really big data set with this many mutations. And this looks at each dot is one gene sized by the number of samples that that gene is mutated in. And then the axis shows the range of the gene in which mutations are occurring in, and then the number of distinct mutations you have in that gene. 
So you can see in the top right here, um, those are sort of uh, genes that it, it looks like they're being knocked out, right? There's not clear selective pressure for one base over another. There's lots of different uh, distinct mutations, uh, and they're happening all throughout the gene, not clustered into one site. But then these mutations on the left here, these are clustered in sort of a, a small region of the gene. Um, and what's very interesting is that these uh, or sort of genes that are being categorized in general almost exclusively are being mutated in a small region of the gene in, in what you know, is purportedly a, a functional site. Uh, whereas for antibiotic specific mutations, those are ones we have being knocked out, although there are also other examples of uh, different kinds. And so this shows, uh, sort of just backing that up, uh, the mutation impact for the different uh, categories. So we see high impact mutations are more common uh, in cycloserine, and then uh, so, uh, that was the one that had sort of lots of knockout genes. And then general resistance mutations, it's very uh, uncommon to have uh, sort of high impact mutations and uh, lower impact or even uh, synonymous substitutions, so uh, affecting uh, sort of the, the cell via um, uh, synonymous, uh, sorry, by, uh, yeah, by codon regulation, as, as Zara was talking about. Um, that's the mechanism there. And then finally, just looking at general versus um, antibiotic-specific functions, we can see differences in the prevalence of the categories, which may be linked in some way to the mechanism of the antibiotic. So for example, cycloserine, uh, which targets cell wall biosynthesis. There's far fewer mutations uh, that are associated with membrane transporters. So potentially, you don't want to sort of disrupt an already challenged uh, membrane cell wall uh, environment if you're exposed to cycloserine. Whereas nitrofurantoin, which results in the generation of reactive oxygen species, we see far fewer energy-related mutations as compared to the other conditions. And then just very quickly, the differences between the RPOB strains. This has been harder to show because, uh, sort of, you, as you would expect, there's fewer differences between strains as there are between antibiotics. But you can see in certain conditions, particularly Q513R with ciprofloxacin, the mutation rate is much higher. Um, and the fact that the which strain has the most mutations changes depending on the antibiotic emphasizes how complicated uh, sort of evol evolvability is in terms of the genotype and antibiotic interactions. And then finally, this is just looking at uh, principal component analysis of the different conditions. You can see that the, that sort of variation of CYP-Q513R is, is the largest source of variation in the data set. Uh, but then after that, they, uh, the conditions broadly cluster by antibiotic along that second principal component. So in conclusion, we've uh, developed a new technique to investigate the likelihood of mutations occurring uh, in different selective conditions. We've used that to identify thousands of resistance mutations, both known and known, in both genic and regulatory regions. Uh, and in the future, adaptations of a technique like this could be used to better characterize uh, mutation spectra for lots of antibiotics and lots of strains with the hope of improving outcomes of antibiotic resistance infections. So thank you very much to the Legator group, uh, Merman, and uh, my uh, CDT, and yeah, everybody.